The subphylum Chelicerata constitutes one of the major subdivisions of the phylum Arthropoda. They have segmented bodies with jointed limbs, all covered in a cuticle made of chitin and proteins. The chelicerate body plan consists of two tagmata, the prosoma and the epistosoma, except that mites have lost a visible division between these sections. The chelicerae, which give the group its name, are the only appendages that appear before the mouth. In most subgroups, they are modest pincers used to feed. The Chelicerata originated as marine animals in the Middle Cambrian period, the first confirmed Chelicerate fossils, belonging to Sanctacaris, date from 500 million years ago. It had forward-facing eyes and five pairs of grasping appendages on the underside of its head, adaptations that suggest it was an active predator convergently similar to anomalocaridids. It probably swam around grabbing onto whatever small prey items it could catch, trapping them in its limb basket while it ate them. The over 1,300 known species of Pycnogonida have leg spans ranging from 1 mm to over 70 cm. Most are toward the smaller end of this range in relatively shallow depths, however, they can grow to be quite large in Antarctic and deep waters. Paleoisipus had several characters unusual for a pycnogonid, such as swimming legs with alternating size, and most significantly, a long, segmented abdomen, which were highly reduced in modern counterparts. The large eyes, robust chelifors and oar-like legs suggest that Paleoisipus was a nectonic visual predator, with associated stalked crinoid as a possible prey item. Individual stern sea spiders are either male or female. Eggs are released from gunnipores on the female's legs and fertilized externally by the male who is standing on or under the female. The male then collects the eggs and presses them against his ovigerous legs where they adhere, forming a large white mass which he carries around. The eggs later hatch into protonymph larvae which can swim. These molt several times, passing through further nymphal stages before developing the proboscis and feeding method of the adult. Instead of spinning a delicate web of silk to trap prey like land spider, a giant sea spider uses an elongate, tube-like proboscis to slurp up its prey. Attached to their heads are a pair of feeding appendages called chelifors, each of which has a pincer on the end. They use these pincers to grab onto prey, such as sponges, which they feed on using a proboscis contained within the middle structure. Also attached to the head section is a pair of limbs used to carry eggs called ovigers. We'll talk more about their breeding habits but both males and females have these egg-carrying limbs. Unfortunately, little is known about the reproductive cycle of the giant sea spider as more research is needed however as the most common form is the free-swimming planktonic form. The evolutionary origins of chelicerates from the early arthropods have been debated for decades. Although there is considerable agreement about the relationships between most chelicerate subgroups. Aphacalus was originally described as an arthropod with chelicerate affinities, with detailed redecryption done by Sutton further suggested it to be unambiguously a chelicerate arthropod. There are large gaps in the chelicerate's fossil record because, like all arthropods, their exoskeletons are organic and hence their fossils are rare except in a few lagerstaten where conditions were exceptionally suited to preserving fairly soft tissues. Weinbergina may have been a benthic animal with some degree of swimming ability, similar to modern horseshoe crabs. 
However, the lack of doublure suggests that it is not adapted for a sediment-dwelling lifestyle as seen in the modern horseshoe crab. The legs with snowshoe-like terminations instead of chela are also more adapted for walking on fine-grained surface instead of searching food items beneath the sediment. The Synzophosurines were ancient marine chelicerate arthropods that were traditionally thought to be early representatives of the horseshoe crab lineage. But more recent studies have shown them to occupy a slightly more basal position on the chelicerate evolutionary tree. Venustulus was one of the earliest known Synzophosurines, it had six pairs of appendages on the underside of its body, with the first pair modified into chelicerae and the rest being walking legs. It also appears to have been blind, lacking any evidence of eyes despite its fossils being fairly well preserved, suggesting it lived in conditions where vision wasn't much use, such as dark murky water or burrowing around in seafloor sediment. Paleomerus is one of the oldest arthropods, being sometimes interpreted as the model of the first arachnomorphs. It is part of the order Strabopoda, a poorly known group closely related to the Aglaspidids of uncertain affinities, often being ignored by researchers and authors due to the poor preservation and abundance of their fossils. Horseshoe crabs are famous examples of living fossils, having changed their external appearance very little over hundreds of millions of years. But some fossil species were much more varied in shape than their morphologically conservative modern relatives, such as Australimulus. Living in freshwater environments in what is now Australia, it had incredibly long spines on each side of its head. The function of these spines is unclear, but they may have acted like a hydrofoil in fast-moving currents, or they may have served a defensive purpose by making Australimulus carapace too wide and unwieldy for some predators to deal with. Horseshoe crabs play a crucial role in their ecosystems by turning over sediment at the bottom of the ocean, which helps to oxygenate the sediment and create a healthier environment for other marine life. Their blood is blue due to the presence of copper instead of iron-based hemoglobin, and it contains amoebocytes that help to detect bacterial endotoxins. This unique feature has made horseshoe crab blood extremely valuable in the biomedical industry for the detection of bacterial contamination in vaccines and medical equipment. Atlantic horseshoe crabs travel long distances during their annual breeding migrations, often returning to the same beaches where they were hatched. They play a major role in the local ecosystems, with their eggs providing an important food source for shorebirds, and the juveniles and adults being eaten by sea turtles. Like other species of horseshoe crabs, Chinese horseshoe crab is an omnivore and feeds on mollusks, worms, other benthic invertebrates and algae. The cephalothorax is protected by this single large, horseshoe-shaped plate, and neither it nor the abdomen is visibly segmented. The tail bears a long spike, known as the telson. These animals have up to four eyes, located in the carapace. Two compound eyes are on the side of the prosoma with one or two median ocelli towards the front. The compound eyes are simpler in structure than those of other arthropods, with the individual omatidia not being arranged in a compact pattern. They can probably detect movement, but are unlikely to be able to form a true image. Brachiopterus is distinguished by its small size, compound eyes with axes converging anteriorly on a subtrapezoid to subpentagonal prosoma. All of its legs are walking legs, the first three pairs are short with spines, except when modified into clasping organs, the last two pairs are moderately long, keeled and tapering in width to terminal claws. The last leg falls short of the penultimate abdominal segment. The abdomen is narrow and ends in a short styliform telson.
Although popularly called sea scorpions, only the earliest Eurypterids were marine, many later forms lived in brackish or fresh water, and they were not true scorpions. Some studies suggest that a dual respiratory system was present, which would have allowed for short periods of time in terrestrial environments. Stylonorella was a small stylonuroid, possessing a subquadrate prosoma with approximately the same length as width. The midsection was slightly constricted and the eyes were parallel and anteriorly located in the anterior half of the carapace. Stylonurus is distinguishable from other stylonurids by their smooth surface, and the greatly elongated fifth pair of walking legs, which reached as far as the telson, which was long and styliform. Compared to the other suborder, Eurypterina, the stylonurines were comparatively rare and retained their posterior prosomal appendages for walking. Despite their rarity, the stylonurines have the longest temporal range of the two suborders. Hippertopterus were sweet feeders, having modified spines on their forward-facing prosomal appendages that allowed them to rake through the substrate of their living environments. Though sweet feeding was used as a strategy by many genera within the Stylonurina, it was most developed within the Hibertopterids, which possessed blades on the second, third, and fourth pair of appendages. Inhabiting freshwater swamps and rivers, the diet of Hibertopterus and other sweet feeders was probably composed of what they could find raking through its living environment, likely primarily small invertebrates. The generic name Megarach means great spider, because the fossil was misidentified as a large prehistoric spider. With a body length of 50 centimeters, it was a medium-sized Eurypterid. If the original identification as a spider had been correct, it would have been the largest known spider to have ever lived. The strata in which Megarachne has been found indicates that it dwelled in freshwater and not in marine environments. Despite only two specimens having been recovered, it represents the most complete Eurypterid discovered in Carboniferous deposits in South America so far. Following their appearance during the Ordovician, Eurypterids became major components of marine faunas during the Silurian, from which the majority of Eurypterid species have been described. The Silurian genus Eurypterus accounts for more than 90% of all known Eurypterid specimens. Though the group continued to diversify during the subsequent Devonian period, the Eurypterids were heavily affected by the late Devonian extinction event. Eurypterids in which the sixth appendage had developed a broad swimming paddle remarkably similar to that of the modern-day swimming crab. Modeling studies on Eurypterus swimming behavior suggest that they utilized a drag-based rowing type of locomotion where appendages moved synchronously in near-horizontal planes. The paddle blades are almost vertically oriented on the backward and down stroke, pushing the animal forward and lifting it up. However, Eurypterus did not swim to hunt, Rather they simply swam in order to move from one feeding site to another quickly. Most of the time they walked on the substrate with their legs. Examinations of the respiratory systems of Eurypterus have led many paleontologists to conclude that it was capable of breathing air and walking on land for a short amount of time. Atelophthalmus inhabited a variety of aquatic environments, including freshwater and marine habitats, and some species were even adapted to survive in brackish water. Although they were primarily aquatic, some evidence suggests that certain they could venture onto land for short periods, likely in search of food or to lay eggs. They were formidable predators, using their large, spiny appendages to capture and subdue prey, which likely included various small fish, other arthropods, and early vertebrates. The two most distinctive features of Megalograptus were its massive and spined forward-facing appendages, far larger than similar structures in other Eurypterids, and its telson. The sharp spike-shaped telson of Megalograptus was not venomous, but it was specialized in that it was surrounded by unique circle blades, 
capable of grasping. It lived in nearshore marine environments, where it used its large appendages, and possibly its telson and circle blades, to capture prey. Possible coprolites are known, which contain fossil trilobite fragments as well as fragments of other megalograptus. This suggests that it might have been cannibalistic at times, like many modern chalicerates. As the Epistosoma of Carcinosoma wasn't as streamlined as that of more active Eurypterids and on account of its unique telson morphology, it is believed that it was not a very active swimmer. It is unlikely to have been well adapted to a completely nectonic, which means actively swimming, lifestyle and is more likely to have been nectabenthic. The flat metasoma of Carcinosoma was probably used as at least partially as aid when swimming, suggested by the pre-telson being slightly expanded in comparison to other Eurypterids. The telson of Carcinosoma appears to have possessed distinct segmentation, it is the only known Eurypterid to possess this feature. Unlike some highly derived Eurypterines, Myxopterus is not thought to have been a good swimmer and it likely kept near the bottom. It likely walked on the bottom with a gait similar to most insects. The two heavy and specialized frontal appendages, held above the bottom, would balance the weight of the long abdomen. The spread appendages would give a decent foothold, perhaps adjustable by raising the tail. On land, the raised tail would act as balance for the body. This was more important on land, as the weight of the body is larger without water. Hug malaria is the most basal known member of the Pteragoshioidea. It was a small-sized Eurypterid, with the largest specimen measuring 20 cm the telson, which was lanceolate and styliform, is distinctly a Eurypterus-like feature. The marginal compound eyes, the relatively large chelae and the chordate metastoma show a great resemblance to Pterygotus. Pterygotus remains have been recovered from the world over suggesting that it was a highly successful predator. It had four compound eyes with two smaller ones on top of the head and two larger ones at the front. This would have given Pterygotus exceptionally good vision for its time with a potentially good degree of depth perception as can be seen in jumping spiders today. It could use its paddle-like appendages for swimming but could also move its tail for propulsion, perhaps to provide an extra burst of speed when attacking prey. It probably would have focused its attention on other arthropods such as trilobites which would have been very common at the time. The pterygotid Eurypterids include many of the large known Eurypterids. Several factors have been suggested that might have contributed to the unprecedented large size of Gecolopterus, its relatives and other large Paleozoic invertebrates, such as predation, courtship behavior, competition and environmental resources. Factors such as respiration, the energy costs of molting, locomotion and the actual properties of the exoskeleton restrict the size of arthropods. Other than the robust and heavily sclerotized claws, most of the preserved large body segments of the pterygotids are thin and unmineralized. Despite being the largest arthropods, the lightweight build of Gecolopterus and other giant pterygotid eurypterids meant they likely were not the heaviest. Studies on the compound eyes and chalicery of Acutoramus has revealed that it would have had a comparably low visual acuity and claws adapted for slicing and shearing, rather than crushing. This suggests that the ecological role of Acutoramus was distinct from that of other pterygotids, it potentially lived a lifestyle of ambush predation or scavenging on soft-bodied animals, feeding during the night or in otherwise low-light conditions. No Eurypterids are known from fossil beds higher than the Permian. This indicates that the last Eurypterids died either in the catastrophic extinction event at its end or at some point shortly before it. This extinction event, the Permian, Triassic extinction event, is the most devastating mass extinction recorded, and rendered many other successful Paleozoic groups, such as the trilobites, extinct. <laughs>